Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool, and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. You know, often in my IT career, I had opened up the certificate manager, which I have displayed on the screen right now, and I knew I, I needed to understand more about this. I needed to understand more about how do digital certificates work and how are they integrated into the overall security posture of Windows. And I knew if I could get two hours of free time as an IT pro, I would like to just dive in and really learn and understand better so I would be better prepared for future problems related to certificates. But of course, I always had 4,000 things pressing on me daily, uh, server issues, a help desk issue the level two tech could not solve and application issues and there was a server issue that, that nobody could figure out and so those two hours with nothing to do never came so today if you've got time i'm going to walk you through and give you some understanding of digital certificates and show you this is amazing technology and how it can help you say if you eventually become say a pki administrator or you get into where you're having to be very much involved in pki deployment or having to build your own certificates for an ssh or establishing your own certificates for a router or a firewall or whatever so if you've got a few minutes come join us and let's learn about digital certificates and windows 11. today as individuals we depend entirely upon digital certificates to allow us to buy online bank online and i don't care what country you're from if you're from east asia if you're from the Arabic nations, whether you're using a mobile phone or you're using a desktop or an iPad or an iPhone, it doesn't matter. You're using digital certificates and you can do financial transactions and shopping and so many things that we do online today and do it safely because of digital certificates. We need to understand what these things do and why they're so important in the safe, reliable, encrypted transactions that we can do online. The foundation security of HTTPS is built on TLS and digital certificates. So if you haven't looked recently, Windows 11 has a lot of cert digital certificates and they're broken down into what's known as certificate stores. There's local machine certificates, there's user specific certificates, there's even service specific certificates, and we're gonna look at them all. Now here's something really interesting. Certificates are stored in the registry as binary data. When a certificate is added to the certificate store in the Windows system, its binary data is encoded as a set of registry values and it's stored in the registry. Now we know the registry to store files, but we're not storing files, we're storing binary data. Although the certificate data is stored in the registry, it's important to note that this data is not saved in the same format as a digital certificate file that is actually saved on the disk. So there's two different formats and we'll look at those. If we save it in the registry, it's formatted a special way. When we take it out or export it out of the registry to a bind file, we encode it a different way. Here is the registry editor and I'm in HK Local Machine Software Microsoft Enterprise Certificates. And here's one location for some of your certificates. Here I've launched the registry editor and again, Local Machine Software Policies Microsoft System Certificates another location for your certificate store. Now you can save certificates as a file on your hard drive. You can also find certificates in a bundle, many certificates as one file. Now common file extensions used by certificates that are saved as files on the disk 
can be the following. Now I launched my favorite file search engine. It's called Everything. And I'm going to put in these and you can see that I have a lot of these certificates on disk. So I'm going to do star dot der and I don't have any of those extensions. Let's do PEM. You can see that I have a lot of PEM certificates on my hard drive. Let me come back and do CRT. There's a number of CRT certificates that are saved on my disk. Let me go back and do a CER. Got plenty of those. Let's go back. There's another extension called P12. Got P12. And of course, these are the most common P7B, spell it, type it right, P7B. And these are typically just certificates. And many of these are bundles, P7B. Now let's do a few more PFX. I've got those. So some certificates are going to be found as files on your hard drive but the actively used certificates are going to be stored in the registry. Now I have a virtual machine, which I installed Windows Admin Center on. Let's take a look at this administrative tool and let's look at what it shows us about each PC's certificate store. I'm going to choose my video editor and go ahead and connect to it. So on the left hand side, I have my various tools and I'm going to choose the certificate on the left hand side and it's going to pull up the certificate stores that are on this particular workstation. And I can see this nice little dashboard. It gives me status. I've got 878 healthy certificates. That's good. A total of 1,069. Six are ex nearly expired. That's nice to know. And 184 expired certificates. Now, I don't know about you. The first thing that comes to my mind is, wait, this is Windows 11. I just, it's updated. It's, what do you mean I have 184 expired certificates on a PC? Well, I'm not going to tell you right now, but I am going to come back to this topic. And when I explain to you why you got 184 expired certificates, you're going to go, oh, okay, that makes perfect sense. But that pretty wild that you got that many expired certificates on a Windows 11 box. If you notice, it's broken down into local machine certificates, certificates that are really for the operating system, for general use, for services, etc., etc. Then you can look at those that are certificates that are specific to the current user. And you can highlight any one of those certificates and you get a detailed pane down here that gives us a lot of information about what's inside that certificate. Okay, I got 1,069 certificates on my Windows 11 box. Where in the world did I get them from? Well, when Windows 11 install, you probably got the largest percentage of those during the installation of Windows 11. And that would include Windows 10 or server or whatever else. Now you can get newer certificates via Windows Update. So Microsoft has a mechanism to update certificates uh, using the Windows Update. Now when you install drivers and some software, you will get additional new certificates added to your certificate store. And you can manually add certificates. We're actually going to show you how to update your trusted root certificate store using Microsoft's download and then manually updating your certificate store so it's the most updated certificates in it. Some of you were doing the math. Let's say 1,069 certificates on 50, 60, 100 Windows 11 boxes plus server plus a data center. How are we going to manage all these certificates in the first place where you're going to roll out what's called PKI, public key infrastructure. So PKI is just really the management system of managing all these certificates, revoking certificates, removing certificates, deploying certificates to devices. How do you manage all this? You do it with PKI. Now, Microsoft has a server role called Certificate Authority, and it is basically Microsoft's PKI system. Most enterprises roll out their own private certificates for their domain, for their enterprise, for their organization. You could use Microsoft Certificate Authority software to do it. You can use third party. 
You can even bring cloud providers to manage all your PKI, software deployment, etc. Here's an example of Global Sign. They have a cloud PKI system that you can purchase. They bring in an appliance into your Active Directory environment. They do all the necessary things to help you deploy and manage your certificates for your system and enterprise. Why do enterprises need public-private key encryption or decryption for digital certificates? Whenever we need secure communications, we're using TLS and SSL for web servers, VPNs, email. If you're going to a passwordless environment for authentication, you're going to be using a certificate in place of a password. So it's very important if you're going to eliminate passwords. Digital signatures, you want to sign code or documents or software, encryption and decryption, and then access control. You can issue individual certificates and based on that certificate, they can do this, but not this. Any of you that are looking for a really good book that's practical on Windows Server, PKI, I highly encourage you to check this book out. Even the federal government must maintain PKI systems. It's known as the Federal Identity Credential and Access Management Architecture, FICAM. It is mandated that all government agencies roll out this Federal Identity Credential and Access Management System. Now, a digital certificate is very much like a passport. It serves as a very important identity document for you and about you. It authenticates and provides trust to a country like Canada or Mexico if you're trying to get into those countries because it was issued by a trusted authority, the U.S. government. It contains unique information about you and it is tamper-proof despite Hollywood showing us everybody and his brother can forge a passport. It has a limited validity period. It's only good for a certain period of time. And if you do something bad in our country, it can be revoked and you won't use your passport anymore. Now, digital certificates are based on the X.509 standard and they contain a lot of information. Serial numbers, serial algorithm ID, validity period, subject name, subject public key information, all kinds of very important information we're going to look at. But the most important thing that a digital certificate carries is the public key. The public key is a mathematical value that's derived from an algorithm, usually based on prime numbers or elliptical curves. It can encrypt data, verify signatures, and facilitate secure key exchanges. Here I've opened up the local computer certificate store and I'm looking at the Trusted Root Certificate Authority substore and I'm looking at certificates and I'm actually highlighting a certificate and I've looked at the details of that certificate and I've clicked on public key and that is the public key of that certificate. Now I copied that public key out and I put it into a text file and it's there before you. It's a very large number and it can be used with an algorithm, encrypt data, and trust me, once this key is used with an algorithm to encrypt data, you're not going to ever break that encryption. The only way you can see the data that this key will encrypt is if you have the private key. So asymmetric encryption works on the public key, which is their digital certificate, and a private key. So let's say that Alice wants to send Bob a secure message. She requests from Bob, said, Bob, send me your public key, which is your digital certificate. He sends her the public key and she then texts a message, encrypts it with Bob's public key. It's now, and you can see in the center, of it's now cipher text. No one's going to ever read that. And then once it gets to Bob, Bob takes out his private key and then he unencrypts it. That is exactly how public key cryptography works. So asymmetric encryption always has a key pair. What's interesting is to derive a public key and a private key, the mathematical process of doing that is that there is mathematical DNA that is shared by both the public key and this unique private key. So with a digital certificate and a private key, this key pair, one key, I can take the public key and encrypt data. 
I can take that private key and decrypt data. I can take the private key and digitally sign a document. With the public key, I can verify that you signed that document. With a private key, I can authenticate. With a public key, I can verify the authentication. This lays the foundation for asymmetric encryption. So let's talk about how do we get certificates? How do we create certificates? The creation of certificates is all based on certificate authorities and trust in those certificate authorities. Listed on this slide are many, many companies that are considered trusted certificate authorities. They create a special certificate and they self-sign it. They put that digital certificate where no one in the planet can get to. And from that very secure certificate, they can create more certificates and they can sell them to, to a bank that then can use them or the federal government that can use them for their agencies or through an enterprise who can use it within their company. When they sell you these certificates, you get a key pair. You get your digital certificate and a private key. You have to have both. And then it's up to you to save and protect and keep secure your private key. That's your responsibility. Now, if any of these companies ever find out that someone has compromised their self-signed certificate that everybody is trusting, it causes big, big problems. So I go to a root certificate authority, some company that is a certificate authority. They use their self-signed certificate to generate an intermediate root certificate which then I can use to generate my corporate certificates. This is known as certificate chaining. Everyone is interconnected because one signs one, the other signs another. There's this relationship or chain that's created by this method. So let's launch my certificate of manager and I'm going to launch the computer certificates, the local computer certificates. I'm going to go ahead and open that up and slide that over. And we've already looked at this. We have already just briefly looked at trusted root certificate authorities. And if I go here, these are all public certificates that come from those trusted authorities. Those large companies, they will give you a public certificate anytime, anywhere. And we have a whole bunch of them in here. But down here is another substore called Intermediate. These are certificates that have been generated by this chaining process. So I'm going to double click one. And if we come up here to the certification path, you can see that Intrust.net was the certificate authority. And they signed the certificate of this below certificate. So now we have this chain relationship. This is the CA. This is the intermediate. We can use this intermediate with confidence because it was signed by a CA. All right, so I go to a certificate authority and I want to purchase a public private key. What do they cost? Well, unfortunately, you can get them for almost free for your personal website. Very low, low cost. In fact, malware companies are now going to purchase their own public-private keys so they can sign their malware and infect you with signed code. Now, enterprises, typically about $2,500 per year will get you a much more established certificate with public key and private key, and that's typically the prices that enterprises pay. Now I'm looking at the utility that shows me the local computer store, and I've got the substore, some documentation called these substores, and it's called Trusted Root Certificate Authority. This is the most important area of certificates because anything in your Trusted Root Certificate Authority substore is implicitly trusted by the local machine. So if you have a certificate in here that is not from a reliable third-party CA, your local machine will trust it. Notice the information that's exposed about each certificate. It was issued to, issued by, expiration date, intended purpose, friendly name. We have a few more columns of information about each certificate, status, certificate template, 
So there's information you can get right from here. Now here I'm looking at a virtual machines trusted root certificate authority. And in most cases on a box like this, it will almost always have a large quantity of certificates but almost no private keys. Very few private keys are going to be on this virtual machine. Let me show an exception. I'm going to look at my video editor and I'm pulling up my local user, my certificates that are pertaining to the users on my video server, and I'm under the personal store and I've shown you my certificates. Look at the icon. Notice up here, these icons don't have a key. This icon has a key. That tells me that this certificate also has a private key that I have stored on my PC. So anytime you see the certificate with the key icon, that means there's a private key associated with it and it's somewhere on your computer. In fact, I'm going to double click this certificate. And if you'll notice, it says right here, you have a private key that corresponds to this certificate. Now in my trusted root certificate authority. Why are these certificates here? Well, I can right mouse click any one of them, go to properties, and notice it shows me what they can be used for. They can be used for server authentication, client authentication, code signing, secure email, timestamp. So right away I can get a clear idea why and what I can use this certificate for on this PC. Now I can go back to that same certificate and just simply double click it and it will open it up. And it shows me that, again, it gives me a list of things that it can be used for on this PC. If I go to details, it gives me a lot of that information that I said that is saved inside of every single certificate. Version number, serial number, all that material. Down here is the public key and that's the actual public key that's in that certificate. Again, not often do you save private keys, but if you're looking for where your private keys are, typically this is one location, users, and then I've got my username. You could just remove homeboss.homelab and put your username, app data, roaming Microsoft crypto. So that's one location that you can put private keys. Another one is under your local machine, under C drive, program data, Microsoft crypto. That's another location for private keys. Now under the immediate certificate authorities, you can see there's a certificate revocation list. If we come over here, it has VeriSign Commercial Software Publisher. If we double click and come over to the revocation list, there are serial numbers for three certificates. In 2001, a gentleman appeared at VeriSign's headquarters saying that he was a Microsoft employee and walked out of their building with three certificates for Microsoft. Fortunately for VeriSign, they ran an audit the next week and they realized what had happened and those are the three canceled certificates for Microsoft. There's also a section called untrusted certificates. So if you had a certificate in your organization and for some reason it was compromised, you could put that certificate in this list and no one on your PC or in your organization would trust that certificate. So you can see categories that make perfect sense. If you roll out enterprise certificates, they're probably going to go in here. If you're going to roll out smart cards, you're going to put your certificates here. So a lot of these different categories of certificates, when you look at them, make perfect sense. Now I went back to my trusted root certificate authority and I clicked on certificates and I sorted by expiration date. And notice I have a certificate that expired in 1999. In fact, I got two and then I got one expired in 2004. Remember I said that I would tell you or explain to you why we have certificates that expired still in our certificate store. And the reason is real simple. Many corporations and companies run legacy applications applications that were designed in 1999 and guess what certificate they have to have in order to run you guessed it now there's a few other reasons why we would keep expired and invalid certificates one is 
It can be helpful to an administrator who's doing a review of certificate history. He may be doing auditing purposes or investigating a past security incident and they don't want to take them out. Sometimes manual cleanups just have not been done. But the most is because of applications that are still dependent on those ancient old expired certificates. So who updates your root CAs? Well, Windows by default updates your root certificate authorities. You can manually update your root certificate authorities and I'm going to show you how. It's recommended if you begin to have certificate errors or problems related to certificates. I'm going to show you how to manually update via Microsoft's authorized list how to update your root CAs. And of course if you have Active Directory you can force the updates via group policy. If you don't like automatic updating. You can go to your local group policy editor. You can go to computer, administrative template, system, internet communication management, internet communication, and turn it off in your group policy. Now, why would you want to manually update your root certificates? If you're generating certificate errors, or you have an older computer, or you have a computer that was given to you and now you're working with it, you may want to manually update your root certificates. And I'm going to show you how we're going to use an elevated command prompt. And we're actually going to use the cert util.exe. We're going to use the dash generate SST and we're going to go to Windows Update and download a file called roots.sst and I'm going to put it in a path in a folder called PS. I just created that. I'm just going to pop that file, that SST file in that directory. Then I'm going to go to PowerShell and I'm run two PowerShell scripts. It's going to go take that roots.sst file and update my trusted certificate authority store. So here on this particular virtual machine, I've got my trusted root certificate authority store open. And if you come down here at the bottom, I've clicked certificates. You can see I have 25 certificates in my trusted root certificate authority sub store. So the first thing I want to do is go create that PS directory. So I'm going to find my C drive and I'm just going to create a folder. And I did it simply because PS makes it easy for writing scripts. So I just created a PowerShell folder in my root directory. I'll put that root SSD file in that PS folder. Okay, I'm going to minimize that. Go to restart, right mouse click, and I'm going to go to Windows Terminal Admin and launch a terminal session. And I'm going to start in the command prompt. So this is an elevated prompt, and I'm going to copy and paste into this command prompt. So let's just paste my utility, and so there's my certutil.exe, my switch and argument. It's going to put this downloaded file into the PS directory, and the file name is roots.sst. So I'm going to hit enter. Now, obviously, this has to be connected to the internet, and it said updated SST file, and command was complete. Let's go to our folder and open up PS, and there it is, roots. That's the roots file. So let me minimize that. And let me go back to my PowerShell. And this time I'm just going to copy and paste from the slide. And it warns me you're pasting into terminal. And it went ahead and ran the first one. We're going to have, let it run the second one. And you can see that it added a bunch of certificates to my certificate store. Let's go back to my certificate store. We'll go here and it looks like nothing changed in this. So here I went up to refresh and punched in refresh and you can see now where we had 25 certificates we now have 457 certificates in my trusted root certificate authority. So we definitely added more CAs into this certificate store. If you're watching this at this point in the video, you are a hardcore technology person. 90% of the people who are on YouTube who watch a video that I create are gone in three minutes. So the fact that you're watching me right now tells me you're pretty hardcore and you're the very reason we do all the work, all the video editing, all the preparation is because of you. You're the person we're after. You want to learn, you want to understand, and you're willing to watch 25 minutes, 30 minutes, 
minutes of just geek stuff and we really really appreciate you one way that you can help us tremendously is support us by liking a video and subscribing it's simple two clicks and it doesn't cost you anything and it really really helps us if you can join that's great it really does help us it's two dollars and something and a month that's a cup of coffee a month we really really appreciate it but it's more important if you can like and subscribe and it's the best way of supporting this channel let's take a quick look at certificates and some of the active directory gpos that you can implement and they are considered best practices now i've created a group policy and i've just opened it up and i'm editing that policy and if you notice under computer Windows settings, down here you've got a lot of public key policy. Now, when I open up the public key policies, there's things that you can do for encrypted file systems, data protection, BitLocker. I'm not gonna cover any of those. I'm just gonna come over here to three policies that you can implement right away. And one of them that's most interesting is the certificate path validation setting. Now under the certificate path validation setting, there are a number of tabs, store, trusted publishers, network retrieval and revocation. Notice that under defining policy settings, there's a couple of check boxes that are recommended. And also root certificate store, it also has some recommended third-party root CAs and enterprise root CAs. So here are some policies that you can implement that are recommended. You can decide who you're going to allow to take care of your trusted publisher certificates. And in most cases, if you're not allowing users to update drivers and install software, you might as well just check the box where it says, allow only administrators to manage trusted publishers. And the checkbox, and below, they have verified that the publisher certificate is not revoked. That also is a recommended policy. Next, under network retrieval, we have the ability to automatically update certificates. And of course, it gives you retrieval time and validation, cumulative retrieval, timeout. Most of those are set already. You can just keep the recommended values. Now, under the revocation tab, none of these policies are recommended. So you can just leave this alone. How can I be sure with as many certificates as I have on any one PC that all the certificates that are there should be there? Well, SigCheck is a utility from Sysinternals that allows you to quickly verify what you have in your store against Microsoft's checklist. The arguments and switches we're going to use is the SigCheck64.exe-tv. And once we've done the necessary steps, it will quickly pop up in the command line certificates that are not in Microsoft's checklist. So let's say you purchased a brand new computer and it's got a pre-installed OS. How do you know that that vendor did not put in some certificates so that some of that junky software will run signed. Well, we can check it real quick. Do a Google search for SigCheck and you'll probably quickly find Microsoft's website, system internal site, and download the SigCheck.zip file. Extract it into your download folder, that's fine. And then you're gonna to go to this link and you're going to download the authorized list. It's a CAB file from Microsoft Update and you're going to put it in the same directory as SigCheck is. And then we're gonna run the SigCheck 64. If it's a 64-bit operating system, which I'm running Windows 11, and they are, dash TV, and we'll check it out. So here on my virtual machine, I did a Google search for SigCheck, and this is the System Turtle site for SigCheck version 2.90. You can go ahead and download that to your download folder and extract it. I'm then going to take that website and copy it and paste it in my browser, and it will download that list from Microsoft Update. And it's just going to put it in the download directory. So here in my downloads folder, I've extracted SigCheck, and so the files are in there. And there's that file that I downloaded from Microsoft Update. I'm just going to slide it into the same folder as SigCheck. And everything is now in there. So I'm going to get in my command line, move to this directory. So I'm using the change directory command, and I'm using some 
wildcard features that save me on typing the entire download uh, folder name. And again, change the directory to sig check. Again, I'm using wildcard to save on typing because I'm lazy. Then I can do sig check 64 minus TV. And it will look at the certificates that I have in my certificate store against the list that I just downloaded. And if there are anything that doesn't match, it's going to pop it up on this command prompt. And here we go. Remember, we added a lot of additional certificates. So it took quite a while to check against the store that we had versus the list. And it said no certificates found. So we're basically in good shape. No valid certificates are in our store that are not in that list. So this is kind of what we saw in our results. But let me show you one that I did on my video editor. Now on my video editor, I did this same thing. And notice I have two certificates that popped up. One was from installing Bitdefender antivirus. So it said, wait a minute, this is a valid certificate. It's in your trusted store, but it's not a part of Microsoft certification trust list. Well, I recognize that's fine. I installed Bitdefender as my antivirus, so I'm not having a problem. Now, the next one is the AMDVE Home Lab Tech Savvy Productions.com. That certificate was installed when I added this computer to the domain. So, both of these certificates, I understand why they're there, they make perfect sense. If I didn't like what I saw, I could go then to the certificate manager and delete those certificates out. So I've been showing you a lot of cool tools, but I haven't shown you the real power in Windows for all this certificate activity. It's a service. It's called Cryptographic Surface in Windows. And it's the one that's doing all the generation and ver ver verification of digital signatures. It does the encryption and decryption of data. It management of certificate and private keys. It protects the root service. It adds and removes trusted root certificate authority certificates. And it does the automatic root certificate update. That's the workhorse. Now, as I was wrapping up this presentation in my Twitter feed, this popped up. It looked like MSI USA, which is the motherboard manufacturer in the USA division of that, that company lost through a data breach, a number of private keys. And during the investigation, which at that point was still ongoing, there was over 57 products that were compromised and on the key signing side and Intel's boot guard, over 166 products could be affected by the loss of these private keys. Guys, keep your private keys. So here I've got my video notes displayed that are in the video description and you can download them. Any of you that are looking to implement Microsoft's Certificate Authority server role, in the video notes, I've got part one to part eight of a well done presentation on how to do that. So if you're interested in that, check out those video notes. It will take you back to the original website and the original content creator, but they're well worth looking at.